So the next guy is uh, Juan Luis, and he's an aerospace engineer at Satellogic, founder, member, and president of Python Spain. And uh, he has authored several online uh, Python courses for science and engineering, uh, Python for science and engineers. And uh, he worked for Airbus, Boeing in data science and software projects. And he teaches Python for big data in two business schools. In his free time, uh, he develops Polyastro, which is a, a Python library for astrodynamics. And he is here today to, 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 to tell us how to get rid of those annoying bugs in our software. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Mantos, for the welcome. Uh, I guess you're loving this picture here. It took me a while to produce. Um, I'm a software person, so I would like to start with a question. How many of you do coding in your day job? OK, so almost all of you. And who wants a method to get rid of all the bugs and write perfect code? Everybody, right? OK, so I'm going to give you the solution now. Don't write any single line of code anymore. That's it. Any questions? <laughs> OK, so now the real talk. Um, <laughs> this talk is about the concept of testing and how to use it properly for algorithmic, mathematical, scientific engineering software. So we're going to review some examples of why I think it's important or why I think you should think it's important. And we're going to define the concept of testing. And we're going to review some typical mistakes that I see that people are doing when doing testing. Uh, in the meanwhile, we're going to mention some Python tools that uh, are going to help you in the process, and we will jump to the conclusions. By the way, the talk is online. You can start it right now and, and follow me there. So a not so long time ago, you might uh, know this example here. The Mars Climate Orbiter performed what we call, in technical terms, an unscheduled little braking. Uh, and in non-technical terms, <laughs> and the root cause analysis determined, sorry, thank you. The root cause analysis determined that the reason was that one contractor was using the metric system and the other was using the imperial system. Uh, that's bad. That's the typical error that we don't want to make, right? But here in Europe, we don't have this mismatch of uh, metric system, so we don't make these mistakes, right? Uh, this is the picture of Crater Schiaparelli. It's an artificial crater that we created a <laughs> couple of years ago. <laughs> And I don't want to be mean on this, uh, but if you go to the report, I'm going to highlight my favorite recommendation of all of them. So robust and reliable sanity checks shall be implemented in the onboard software, including but not limited to check on altitude sign, cannot be negative, okay? Check that vertical acceleration during terminal descent and landing cannot be higher than gravity, sounds fair. And check the altitude magnitude change, which, for example, can change from 3.7 kilometer to a negative value in one second, because that would violate the speed of light and <laughs> who knows what else. So if you go to the report, you will see it's a bit more complicated than that. I'm joking, right? So it's not only like a software failure, it's uh, more complex. But I want to talk about what can we do on the software side to reduce these kind of errors. So testing, what is testing? This is the definition from Wikipedia. It's an investigation conducted to provide stakeholders with information about the quality of the software product or service under test, which is a pedantic way to say that we want to find out whether this has errors or not. You, you know that a definition is pedantic if it contains the word stakeholders already. <laughs> so the assumption is that you have some tests. I don't care if it's an end-to-end -end simulation that compares the value of today with the value of yesterday, or maybe it's an Excel sheet that someone is filling up with some requirements or stuff like that. You know, it's not the funniest stuff in the world, but at least I assume that you have some sort of thing. So the typical mistake number one, 
uh, is not having automated tests. I found this tweet the other day and I find it perfect, which says that if you use software that lacks automated tests, then you are the tests. And I think this is very true. Uh, people fail running the tests. We fail writing code, so we fail running the tests sometimes. Uh, confronting a coworker works can be tough at times. Maybe if he's, he's your boss, or maybe you know it's very late in Friday evening and you don't want to say, ah, oh, you know, this is wrong, let's just stay a couple of hours more and fix it. You know, there are lots of human factors in testing that can prevent us from doing a proper uh, investigation, okay? So we should try to automate everything, including running the tests as much as possible. So the typical mistake number two is not having unit tests. Uh, in principle, I hope that you write software um, using functions and modules, packages, whatever you call it, in the tool that you use. So if our software is made up of small pieces, then our tests should be small pieces as well. So the idea is to take the individual pieces of the software and try to test them individually as much as we can. If a small piece of software cannot be tested or it's difficult to test, maybe it's a sign of bad design already. So we can do something about it. We can try to refactor in the slides that you can find online. I, I linked some resources that you can read in case you're interested. So the typical, the typical mistake number three is shooting yourself in the foot. And now we get to the interesting part. Imagine that you have this task which is uh, implementing the sync function. Uh, I am glad that I don't have to ask for forgiveness for putting math and code in a presentation. So you will start like this, okay? So you write the function, everything's going fine. And if you want to do the test, you say, okay, I'm lazy today, again, it's Friday afternoon, so I'm going to test that this works for x equal one. Okay, so I'm going to write this test over here. The sink of 1.0, it's equal to the formula there. All right, so I run the test and it passes, perfect. I can go home, right? No, because I'm copy pasting probably. If I have a formula like the sink, it's okay, I can write it again. But if I'm having a formula like this, imagine a Jacobian or a derivative or whatever, who of you is going to rewrite it again? And even if you do, you can make different typos in one place or another, so it's a very bad way to do testing. Also, we are missing testing in the corner cases because I'm only testing in x equal one. We will get to that in two minutes. And bogus floating point comparisons, my favorite topic of all of them. And as you know, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 is not 0 0.3, but, wait, no. <laughs> Can you try to switch it off and on again? <laughs> IT? Okay. Okay. But 0 0.2 plus 0 0.3 is equal to 0 0.5. Boom! What do you think of it? <laughs> so please stop doing this if you are still doing it. It's not a good thing, uh, but we will get to the good way of doing that from Python. And the typical mistake number four is not covering the corner cases. This is a pretty obvious example of a corner case that we're going to see, but we cannot always anticipate which are going to be the corner cases, okay? So for a very simple example, I'm going to give some ideas. In this case, I can say, okay, maybe one value was too little. I'm going to test four values, okay? Minus two, one, one, and two. And uh, with this PyTest parameterize thing, you can repeat the test for many values. This is very cool. So you run the test and all the test passes, that's perfect. But it fails for zero because we are dividing zero by zero and then we get another number which is different from itself. Oh, we failed again, sorry. So how can we cover ourselves from this kind of um, corner cases? There's a very interesting tool that is called Hypothesis that generates automatically test cases for you. So you just give it that I'm going to test this function with the floats, and if you print the output of this, it's actually going to test zero, minus infinity, infinity, 0 0.999, all these kind of uh, crappy values that might uh, affect your function in any way. Um, so you're going to have a much more coherent uh, way to test all your functions. So now, you fix the function, okay, because if equal x equals zero, the result is 1.0.
And then what do we do with the test? Because this is going to be none again, right? So we cannot just copy and paste the formula again. And we could do, okay, if x is equal to infinity, then the expected value is one, I don't know, all this sort of thing. But there are still better ways. We need validation data, okay? To avoid all these typo errors of copy pasting and etc., what we should do, in my opinion, is to try to check this against some external source of data that we don't necessarily control. For instance, we, have, we can go to tabulated values somewhere, we can go to some paper that performs our experiment in con control conditions to see what the data, what the expected data is. And of course, we should do floating point comparisons correctly to avoid all these kind of tolerance errors that we can find. This is an example from, from my project, from Polyastro. So I'm saying, okay, I'm going to convert this um, semi-major axis, semi-parameter, eccentricity, inclination, blah, 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 to the Cartesian vectors. So I'm taking an example from a very famous book, and I'm applying my function over here, and now I'm taking that, okay, within this specified tolerance, then my results match to what I should expect. So this is like a better way of testing numerical functions. There's still many questions to ask, like how much precision do you, should you ask for? Because it's not clear whether you should do some numerical analysis, uh, where are the sources of the uncertainty coming from? So there are lots of open questions here. And also the issue of external data. With the previous example, I have a textbook exercise that I can copy from a book, but for more complex examples, you will have to go to the scientific literature and this is my observations about the data you can find out there. The first one is that nobody cares. The second is that those who care don't share it, but those who share it do it with one decimal place, and this is true story, so what am I expected to do with it? Those who share it with 16 decimal places don't describe how it was obtained. Please release the source code. And those who release the source, it make it impossible to compile. <laughs> so the situation out there is pretty bad. We do as much as we can, but we are not superheroes. So an alternative is to use external software. For instance, I develop an astrodynamics library, so I would validate against Orekit, Spice, SDK, all this stuff, right? But it's sometimes commercial, so that's uh, painful for me. I use Linux, so installing SDK on a virtual machine with Windows, blah, 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 it's a pain. And also, sometimes the external software is so complex or so uh, different to what you're doing that it's not always easy to generate exactly the case that you want to validate. This is a problem. And also, sometimes the external software is not validated itself. Here I sent a link to a very interesting paper of uh, some mathematicians telling that they found a bug in Mathematica or Maple, now I don't remember, that they were doing eigenvalue decomposition the wrong way and they found out like after months of investigation. And this is a pain to use because you should trust your tools and assume that everything is validated there. But as this specific case is closed source, there's no way to go to the code and say, oh, you're missing a times two here. So there's no perfect situation, I am sorry. Conclusions, writing good and comprehensive tests is not trivial, but we need to because we want to avoid this kind of stupid errors. There are tools that hand that help uh, automate everything is a good way to go because we try to reduce the human factors Validate what you use because it might bite you. And remember, that it's not written here, the only book-free code is the one that you don't write. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Thank you. Red again with the microphone. Oh, I see hands up, but that's with the phone. Yeah. <laughs> Questions, comments? So I can share uh, my experience. Um, I uh, don't deal with functions like sync, but uh, uh, the kind of numerical um, code that I wrote was uh, you have a simple algorithm and then you want to optimize it. For example, an, a simple example would be computing variance. Mm -hmm. You can do it with um, like two passes of the array or you can do it in a single pass. Um, and my way, so I don't usually have to deal with um, accuracy so much. 
um, but uh, instead the uh, algorithms need to be robust, for example, to NANs, to missing data. Um, and what I do is I write a um, obviously correct but slow code path, code path and then a optimized version and then um, compare those two for randomly generated data. Yeah, that's a perfectly valid uh, example. In my final project that it's linked in my GitHub as well, I do this sort of thing. I check some numerical control laws for low thrust uh, maneuvers and stuff like that. And I try to compare the output with the analytic solution, for example, the, within the simplified assumptions, of course, with the numerical output. But sometimes one is much easier than the other to compare. Yeah, nobody said it was, it was easy. So. All the things that you, could, that you can do, for instance, you were mentioning about covariance, seeking, and stuff. If there is absolutely no way you can validate this against external data, then try to validate it against yourself yesterday. So you can write a regression test and write somewhere what was your result today and try to make sure that your covariance calculation doesn't change for the same inputs a long time. But you have to do that for a small piece because if you do that for the whole program, then it's going to be much more difficult to detect errors. Question? No more questions? I think if you, go, if you want to get involved in AstroDynamics, uh, uh, the Riot channel is uh, an amazing place, and Juan is an amazing uh, lead maintainer and, and dynamic uh, dynamic uh, oh, person you can it. talk to, yeah? <laughs> so, oh, we have one more question here. Yeah? yeah, okay, it's mainly more an open question for everyone because here we have a lot of uh, developers and, and, and the open source uh, software. And I would like to know how, how they deal no, uh, with the bugs or how, how they ensure that the, the software that they are doing is, uh, they believe that uh, it's providing the good results, something like that. So, yeah, yeah. on your side. In, in my specific case, I validated a lot uh, against NASA and SPICE data, for instance. And we had an issue in AstroPy last year because the heliocentric uh, reference, sorry, the ecliptic reference frames, they had a bug in the conversion code. There was a minus instead of a plus sign. And it was messing it up all my code but not theirs, because they were doing mostly like astrometric observations where the positions were not very important. But for me, it was a noticeable effect. So in the end, the more people that use the code, the more bugs that come to the surface. And there has to be like an ongoing effort to check that everything is correct. So I try to, now I validate against, uh, as I said, Horizons data mainly, like the web interface to the NASA ephemerides. But I would love to, validate against spines, orchid, and whatever. Maybe it's, it has value in itself to have like benchmarks. So to say, okay, let's propagate this simple orbit for 24 hours and compare the output of all these programs and then uh, plot like the errors and the differences between them and try to explain if there is one difference between the other that is higher than normal, then why is that? And I don't know, there are many, many things that we can do, but it takes time. And it's not always obvious that it adds value to the project, right? Because we have to write the features, but validation is equally important, I would say. Okay. Okay. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Ah. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah.